I uh, I re usually record this to uh, to YouTube just because it's um, it's easier for me and I don't have to remember to upload the video anywhere afterwards. It's already there. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, CET 497, and we have some student presentations today. But before we do that, let me let me introduce the um, the slides and. So that's where we are, right? We um, we've done a we started off the, the semester with um, a lot of uh, ideation, idea generation, and um, trying to figure out what we want to do in a capstone course. And we a couple of few weeks ago we did a, a down select on the um, the projects and the proposals from each team are now going to be done uh, later in today's session. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, before we get there though, um, we have uh, a guest, um, Doug wrote, Doug, I, I don't know so much about your background, except like, as you said earlier, that you, you, you've spent most of your career chasing BTUs, chasing power and, um, uh, Doug has a really interesting um, multidisciplinary project that he wants to get up and running, and uh, I've invited him into the course today to uh, to tell us about it. the The summary is on the screen. I think I sent the uh, the word file into the uh, the the CET four ninety seven materials uh, chat channel uh, yesterday. So. Um, Doug, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, about the project, please. Okay. Well, thank you for the uh, invitation, Peter, to uh, intrude on your class, especially on an important day like it sounds like today. Um, but I'm really excited about um, this opportunity to involve students from multiple departments, uh, all working on something that has tangible benefits to the CCSU Energy Center. Um, you asked me for just a couple comments uh, about myself. Um, when I was in behind the desk, as these students are, um, I uh, chose to follow thermodynamics versus machine design as a mechanical engineer and uh, had a job uh, designing um, equipment for power plants. And I was very fortunate that uh, in my career up at combustion engineering in Windsor, I was involved with the um, transfer of technologies and the invert, um, invention of new technologies. Um, an example was the power plant as you cross the Charter Oak Bridge on your right, the waste energy facility. I was responsible for that conceptual design. <laughs> wow. Cool. Um, so that was that was um, something very unique, and I see by the names some of your students were my former students, so they probably heard these some of these stories. Um, I left combustion engineering um, because I had a offer to work for Hartford Steam Boiler Inspection and Insurance Company. Okay, and the HSB. Um, sold me as an engineering company who sold financial guarantees called insurance. But what it did, it was flip my whole um, perspective, let's say, on, on big stuff, because now I was working for probably one of the most risk adverse companies in the world, an insurance company. And Let's say risk, risk more, aware um, rather than risk averse. <laughs> well, no, they, they didn't want, they never liked the risk that they, they underwritten. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 it was something else. But um, while I was there, um, I was um, head of the in house engineering department, among some other things. And in that capacity, we did predictive maintenance. Cool. And for our insurers. And I immediately saw the value for both the insurance company and my customers on how to um, 
stop unnecessary downtimes. By trending performance of key equipment, you were able to plan ahead to avoid outages, which cost everybody a lot of money. And then uh, in the mid nineties or so, I formed my own risk management company for technologies. Um, since 2000, we were, um, the company was involved with fuel cells and hydrogen. And so I've been on the cars and the filling stations and the use of hydrogen for as the process gas and things. Um, in the mid, I'm trying to think, maybe early 2000s, uh, we had the only um, distance learning uh, hydrogen safety course in the world. So we cool. were getting um, students from ac across the globe, you know, signing into the course. And unfortunately, the Department of Energy liked it so much, they put up their own course for free. And that ended my business as far as selling <laughs> training, <laughs> though we still do uh, seminars and stuff. But the online things just, you know, had to go by because I was charging and they were free. Right. Anyways, uh, a friend of mine uh, said he heard that he was teaching as a uh, adjunct at Central and they needed a uh, somebody to teach a course in about six years later i'm still there <laughs> uh teaching my courses um i was fortunate enough to be um, an emergency replacement for four semesters which means i had an office on campus and a full course load so uh, i really kind of missed that but one of the things i try to do in my courses is bring as much practical experience uh to the students, you know, it, it's nice to know theory. It's nice to be able to do problems, but you have to be able to think. And right. when you're in in the profession, you're not going to say, "Oh, yeah, Mr. Rohde gave me this homework problem," uh, you know, six years ago. <laughs> you won't even remember that, right? And be lucky if you remember me. But you get my drift. So. Um, I became uh, almost a natural draw <clears throat> with the folks up at the energy center. Um, my first question is, does anybody know where it is on campus? I didn't even know we had an energy center. <laughs> <laughs> You've already there learned you something. <laughs> You've already learned something. So there. <laughs> so, you know, that was going to lead to my next question. How many have you actually visited it? Okay. And I suspect very few unless they took one of my courses. But the uh, energy center is really like the heart of the campus. And the reason I say that is that it provides a campus with electricity, steam, condensate, and control for many of the campus operating systems. All are run by that building east of Copernicus Garage up on the hill uh, that's a brick building, okay? Some, um, such as Peter mentioned, the fuel cell is outside in a fenced area, but the the center, the control room and all that is inside that brick building. And we've been very fortunate because the energy center almost operates as an energy island. And what I mean by that is, for instance, during Hurricane Sandy, it was one of the few... Um, energy providers that was still in business because as the whole grid went down it was able to stay intact and producing power and it's what it needed and was one of the uh, linchpins to get everybody get back online because it was able to provide electricity mm. so because of its importance uh, we talk in terms of the security of its operations and what i mean by security I'm, I'm worried about un, uh, unscheduled downtimes and now cyber attacks, okay? Um, the good news is for this particular project, the energy center management is 110% supportive, as is the provost and President Toro has given a green light to at least proceed, okay? 
So um, what is this effort going to be? Okay. Well, as the little flyer indicates, we're looking for um, students to uh, look at developing predictive maintenance and cyber security tools that will be used by the Energy Center. And we're looking for students that would represent engineering, uh, engineering, uh, computer science, and electronics, and graphics technologies. The reason for that is that there's a bunch of technologies that form the basis for predictive maintenance and cybersecurity. But the real benefit doesn't come that you have a vibration monitor on a, on a rotating piece of equipment. The real value comes is that you collect the data and able to trend where the data is taking you so you can predict when it starts to deteriorate and you can make plans to either fix it or replace it without incurring a um, unscheduled outage. So in the uh, predictive uh, maintenance area, um, what we're going to be looking at is vibration monitoring and what we call thermography, which is infrared measuring. Um, vibration is, is, of course, a key uh, indicator when a bearing is failing, right? It, it starts to, you know, uh, vibrate more than it should. Same thing with motors, as they run hot, they're getting closer and closer to the failing point. So, since this is a uh, just the start of this whole project, <clears throat> there's bigger plans and vision down the road, but for now, we just want to focus on those two types of technologies. On the cybersecurity side of the thing, um, there is, of course, a lot of cybersecurity uh, tools being used by the university and the state of Connecticut and the like. Uh, since the energy center is connected to the local utility, Eversource, there are some um, tools, you know, being in place there. But the university is kind of unique in that we have uh, a lot of potential impacts, which would all just classify as the Internet of Things. You know, you can't, you, you know, a key card getting into a dorm room to be actually an entree point for a cyber attack. Okay, I, you say that's crazy, but this is the world we're kind of living in now. So what we want to do is to um, tie the two together and cyber attacks affect the global community where a lot of replacement parts come, okay? You all heard about the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal, okay? If there was motors or, you know, turbines or something sitting on that ship, guess what? They're not going to make it on time to wherever they have to go to, right? And so if, if you buy motors from Germany and the Germany uh, manufacturing facility is down because of cyber attacks, it will affect how we have to be able to plan our course of action. So the global impacts of all this, even though we're looking at our small campus, the ramifications are much larger, okay? And that is a perspective that I think is very valuable for students. Um, okay. I mean, even though I was working for for a company that built power plants, uh, it was almost a year before I, I was able to visit one. And and what looked like this small of a picture was gigantic when I saw it, okay? And that was just called a, a package boiler, which was something built in a factory, okay? So to be, be able to gain this real-world hands-on experience I think is very valuable for students to get as much as you can as undergraduates. The other factor, which I always um, ask my bosses about, how does my contribution play in the bigger picture? You know, if I was giving one assignment to do uh, metallurgy for two, 
how did that impact the, the, the entire power plant type of thing, right? So in this case, you're going to see immediate results because as we launch these tools and they're adopted by the energy center, the uh, rewards to the university should be tangible, not just monetary, but we should hopefully improve the overall efficiency of their operation, okay? So the fact that you're part of that exciting new venture, you know, here at Central, I think is, is, is fantastic. And my last comment is, speaking for myself as my little brief introduction, I have always enjoyed being on the cutting edge of new stuff. You know, it, it's really kind of cool to, to be there. I, I, I always, I, I always, um, I always wonder at people who don't think engineering is, is creative, right? The, the fact that, you know, you, you're always, not always, but you're often doing new stuff either in a new environment or for somebody new. It's, it's a, it's a, at least a partially creative endeavor and that, you know, I think that's great. And, and so, um, what I would like to do is try to, uh, get two students from each of these disciplines, schools, departments to work as a team. Uh, of course, Peter and all his colleagues will, you know, uh, help to mentor as we move forward, you know, doing different things, um, little pieces of that action, if you would, um, Somebody may not have to be there forever, but would be, you know, an advisor or a mentor, a consultant to the group. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be functioning as the so-called project manager uh, per the dean. So I'm the, the glue, I guess, to hold it all together. And we're looking to try to have some results at the end of the two semesters. Okay. Um, for those who might be interested, you know, who may not be able to uh, have a, you know, day job this summer, um, there's an awful lot of work involved in just getting ready to actually start. So um, I'm talking to the dean about if we can do some accommodations to um, consider a part-time job or something to get a little bit of work done over the course of the summer. Right. And I'm doubtful if it will happen, but it'd be great if we could. Right. So, um, thank, thanks, Doug. I, I really appreciate this is This is really good stuff. Um, just as a an aside, so years ago, I, I used to do some um, uh, work in heavy industrial areas like uh, I worked in a, a steel mill, I worked in a, uh, a cane crushing facility in, out in, in Australia. And the, uh, the predictive maintenance part at the, at the steel mill, one of the things we were doing was um, uh, they had a, a, a thing called a hot strip mill, which basically took a, a, a slab of steel one foot thick and about, I don't know, 60 feet long and rolled it so that it was an inch thick and quite a bit longer and the the entry yes. rolls the entry rolls yeah. on that that hot strip mill took a lot of punishment and they were the usually the things that went and the trouble is they went with within 24 hours the strip mill only had a down at eight hour down every week so they wanted to be able to to predict at least a week ahead that the, sure. the 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 rolls needed to be replaced. So we we did we instrumented it all up and uh, managed to give them some a, a level of forecasting. I think we got about eight days as the. Oh, that's a lot. Yeah, right, that's which, good. Which was is kind of fun, um, but yeah, it's yeah. it's a it's that like that's interesting. And there, some of the stuff I'm doing now is is more on the cyber security side. So you you've hit two sweet spots for me, which is kind of interesting. Um, so what I'm what I'm going to suggest to let me just uh, 
go back to what I'm going to suggest to the students is um, we have uh, we have the um, the student presentations now if anybody any of the students is interested um, what I'm going to suggest is we we finish out the semester and let me just go back to that window and so you can see me a bit better maybe where is there so um, we finish out the semester and um, if anybody's interested um, I can put you in touch with Doug and I would suggest um, doing something with Doug over the summer um, and getting a feel for what the project involves and then if we need to switch your project from what you're currently working on to uh the the this project um then we can figure that out over the summer so that um we can we can uh do what you need to do for the capstone project in terms of the the reporting and everything that i'm asking everybody to do um but that you can hopefully uh transition um into this without adversely impacting anybody else who's who's decided to continue with what they're doing okay that that's what i'd suggest i i think there's i think it's a i think it's a good good project um i think uh if there's anybody interested let's talk about it either with me or with doug or with both of us and uh, let's let's figure out what to do peter i'm very grateful that's that's it more than I could hope for. Thank you. Um, no, I think it's like I said. I'm. I think uh, there's lots there. I'm a little disappointed. It's so late in the semester, but that's. It is what it is. You got to take these opportunities when they arise, rather than when you want them. <laughs> yeah. Well, believe me, we've been at it for a year, and we only got green lighted recently, and. I think that the whole COVID and not being able to get together delayed things. Well, one because I think ideally we wanted to have it in the fall. Right, you know? right. So the um, one thing that is kind of interesting, I like as I said, I'm working at Fairfield, and the way they do their capstone projects there is they they almost always try to get a multidisciplinary team for the projects, and I, I think that has a lot adds a lot of value to the students, right? So they get mechanical engineers working with software engineers, working with chemical engineers or with um, bio, biomedical, right. right? And I think that's, I don't know how hard it would be to, to work into Central's way of doing things, but um, it, I think it'd be, it'd help with projects like this, right? Definitely, I mean, this is the first, hopefully there are many. Um, for instance, I would love to marry some business people in <laughs> at right. some point in time, you know, from the business. I mean, why not, right? So, you know, this, to say this is important is an understatement. I mean, you know, this is the first one. If it's successful, it will allow more creativity and more projects to happen. So okay um, okay thank you. Well, thank you for coming I, I i was i'm interested to hear your background i, I was in definitely interested to hear more about the project um and uh we'll i'll i'll if, if uh, i have a chat with the students um we'll we'll see how we go i'll i'll let you know but i'll, I'll be in touch um sometime later either maybe not today i'm a little busy today i'm teaching all day um but uh certainly over the weekend or early next week Okay. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone. Good yeah. luck on your presentation. Thank you. That was very Thank interesting. Thank you. Yeah, you'll. Bye now. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Any uh, quick comments? None that I have in mind. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it's a. I think it's an interesting um, 
I think it's an interesting project. It sounds pretty cool. I just, uh, I was, I, I think you said it was for the summer and the fall. Right, that and that's right, okay. yeah, and it it doesn't quite mesh with uh, our timing. It might be better for yeah. um, uh, Jonathan Braverman. He's taking four ninety seven next semester, um, so I'm I'm definitely going to ping uh, Jonathan because I I really would like to see something happen with this. I think it's a I think it's a really interesting project, and as I said, it, it sort of hits two sweet spots with me. One on the the signal processing side for the predictive maintenance and the other on the um uh the the cyber security side for the uh on the software side that's kind of interesting okay um yeah so uh let me know get just just uh ping me if you if you have any interest even if you just want to maybe there's there's a i i told him um, before, when we, we talked about it before this, um, that uh, the way to get really um, somebody interested would be to, you know, to have a, you know, a, a, as he mentioned, a part-time position over the summer. I think that would really uh, help um, basically with the, the getting engagement um, because I, I've found with, with Capstone projects over the summer um, that they, every group, and this is the third group, every group has good intentions of doing stuff over the summer, but it very rarely works out. Um, only so, uh, but if there's something else other than just the Capstone, because summer happens, right? You've got, um, you've got the summer, you've got Maybe you've got to work. Maybe you've got other stuff. So, okay. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a quick two-minute break. And um, I, you've seen these slides before. The aim is to uh, to get the presentations. And I've I've already had the uh, the home security people um, volunteer to go first. So I don't have uh have to do bingo to uh to choose who goes first i may have to do bingo to choose who goes second um, unless uh, the the parking garage and the fridge people uh want to come to an a, a agreement about it but uh give me uh give me two minutes and i'll be right back okay i just have a quick question professor yeah go for it do you want the presentation shared to you? Because we have it on a shared document, or do you want me to just share my screen? Um, I So two things. Um, during the presentation, you have to control what's happening, so you share your screen. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, All right. Once that's done, I want the presentation or a link to the presentation uploaded into Blackboard. Sounds great. All okay. Right. Okay. I'll be right back. All right, fridge automation, it's time for some rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> what do you mean, rock, paper, scissors? We already got it. For a second. I'll battle you to the death for a second. Yeah, we're going first, so then nobody can, you know. Do one do one on rest. I don't really, I don't really do it. <laughs> one do one on rest. Yep. Put people on. Intervention only. Take you to war zone, to the gulag you go. Smoke in the gulag. Did anyone else make a PowerPoint? Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay. Uh, so we played some rock, paper, scissors, and uh, fridge automation is going to be going second. <laughs> Sounds good. So we we've got uh, one, two, and three. Okay. Rock they paper. They just want to save the best for last. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing my screen, and if the home security 
whoever from home security is going to share. I will Okay, I think that's that's about where we are. Let me just make that full screen. And so uh, our first uh, presentation is by Michael, Bright, Kyle and Jacob and it's called Home Security drone project proposal uh, take it away all right good morning everybody <laughs> <laughs> um this i see bright still muted too i'm not sure if he's ready oh yeah he'll probably unmute when it's his turn all right sounds great but let's get into it all right you give me yep perfect all right so this presentation today will be about our proposed plan to design and uh, develop a home security system based uh, around the use of a flying camera drone right so this presentation will cover a lot of different things um, in the statement of need We'll talk about why our system is a good alternative to the security systems that are out there today. Um, we will talk about the functional and non-functional requirements for our system. Uh, this will include, you know, some technical requirements for how the system will function. Um, we will talk about what skills are going to be utilized in order to achieve our goal of a working uh, security system. Uh, included in these skills are app development, 3D printing, networking, programming, and an understanding of electronics. We already have some of these team, uh, some of these skills as a team, but we do have a lot that we still need to learn. Um, we will talk about the roles taken on by each member of the team, although with how much there is to do and how much we still need to learn. Uh, I'm sure each member will contribute in some way to every part of the project. We will then talk about how feasible this project is based on the time requirements and the required skills that we need to work out. And finally, we'll talk about the budget. What do we need to make this thing work? Um, you know, what are we going to purchase? What are we going to print? What are we going to borrow? Stuff like that. Um, so this project will be worked on for the entirety of this year with the final prototype being completed for presentation by December. Next slide, please. Thank you. So statement of need. Choosing a, so a home security system can be a daunting task, right? Should the homeowner just buy some cameras and mount them around the property? Not necessarily a bad idea, but cameras mounted in fixed positions do have the unfortunate downside of blind spots. Um, sure, you could buy and mount more cameras, but this could become quite expensive depending on how many you need. For example, the Home Depot sells individual ring cameras for $199. So you could see that just three cameras would cost you upwards of $600, and you would still not have full area coverage. You would still have blind spots in each of those cameras, and you might even need more than, than that to cover your entire property. So another solution would be subscribe to a more complex system like ADT. Also a fine idea, but this requires expert installation, and again, their system uses cameras mounted in fixed positions. So that's really one of the biggest downsides of systems today is blind spots. Um, our idea, right, would be to utilize a drone to completely eliminate blind, sp blind spots. Excuse me. Um, this controllable flying drone 
would allow the system owner to essentially cover their property using just one camera on the drone in conjunction with motion detection sensors, right? So these sensors are going to be placed around the property, and when they detect motion, they will ping an alert to a mobile application that we will develop, um, and it will go directly to the security owner's cell phone. And then within that application, the owner, the security owner, will then be able to take control of the drone and fly it around their property in order to, <clears throat> uh, in order to go investigate the disturbance. So we <clears throat> we see this as an ideal solution for combating blind spots because you know with a mobile drone you're really not limited. You can go wherever you want. Um, plus, it helps that flying the drone is just a bit of fun, right? <laughs> so, um, that's it for me. On to the next one. So, for our project description, <clears throat> the goal of this project is to design a functional home security drone that will patrol inaccessible areas and notify security system owners. In our next few slides, we will describe the functional requirements, non-functional requirements, and display a use case diagram of the system. So the first bullet point will be mobile. This means that the drone does not have to remain in a fixed location. When needed, the drone will be able to fly around patrolling out of reach areas requires network the drone shall connect to Wi-Fi meaning to interact with the drone the drone must be connected to a wireless connection records media when detection is sensed the drone will record during the day or the night power the drone shall mount on a rechargeable station once the user is done operating the system next slide so i'm going to be talking about um, the non-functional requirements so the first bullet point is um operate via rechargeable batteries so our plan is to um get a station where um we're gonna have a um, rich uh, charging station so anytime the uh, drone is done operating, it goes back to that charging station to be recharged. And um, our next point is record after detection for a minimum, a maximum of ten minutes. So after any detection, um, the homeowner is gonna uh, fly the drone around and then record what is going on in the area for about ten minutes for a maximum of 10 minutes and then it goes back to its charging station and then fly for a minimum of 10 minutes as because um the longest it can fly for is 10 minutes it can't go above 10 minutes so after 10 minutes the drone will go back to its charging station and then be recharged and the next point is not exceed the maximum weight of point and 10 pounds so the uh, the drone itself, the weight itself is not going to exceed 10 pounds, which is um, what we're trying to work with. We got a smaller drone. And um, next slide. So the use case. This diagram displays the actions each actor has on a specific function. Each function has branches, which includes different features of that function. So outside of the system boundary are four actors. We have the security system owner, the authority, the criminal, and the home. Inside of the system boundary are two specific functions, which are control home security and protect home. Now control home security includes four features, which are contact authorities, make an account, voice alert, and notify. Protect home includes four features as well. 
which are patrol, inaccessible areas, record media, detection, and install sensors. Next slide. The next two sections will discuss the organizational information, which includes the team approach and the roles each member has. So for the team approach, um, these are the following skills that we're gonna need in order to embark on our project. Um, assembling of the drone. So we, what we decided was to buy a drone that is not already um, assembled. So we buying, and then we're gonna assemble it ourselves. So we're gonna need someone who is really good into drones to um, do the assembling. And then we're also going to need a programmer. Um, so we, what we plan to do is uh, the drone will be uh, controlled via um, phone. So we're going to need someone who can program, write a program for the phone so that we can use that to control the um, drone. And the next one will be um, 3D printing. We're going to be printing um, uh, the station and then um, a cover um, to protect the drone from wet, like rain and the sun and all that. So uh, we're gonna need someone who also has uh, an idea in 3D printing to do that for us. And then um, the soldier, and we're gonna need someone who also has a soldier and um, knows how to do that because uh, we're gonna be doing a lot, a lot of wiring for the um, the charger and uh, on the drone. Next slide, please. And so for the roles, um, Mike is gonna be our team leader um, for the programming. Since we all have programming skills, we decide to um, we said that everybody is gonna get involved with that. So whoever can really help, and then we we'll go with it. And um, for the 3D printing, um, we don't have a 3D printer. We're gonna borrow. And I know someone who um, has one, and Carl also knows someone who has one. So whichever works for us, um, we will use that. So but we put Carl and myself down for that. And then for the networking, um, we put everybody down because we all have networking skills. We've all taken the networking classes. So yeah, you're going to need every, every everybody's input on that. And then for the submissions, we got Mike. He's going to be doing all the submissions for us. Next slide. Moving on is to feasibility, which I will talk about accessibility, group distribution, and sort of about the budget, but more talk about on the next slide. Um, the individual parts necessary to complete this project are pretty much accessible and affordable. Um, we're planning on purchasing a drone as a kit, which allows us to build the drone ourselves, but then able to combat it in a way that we could add more things to it. Um, the work will be even duly distributed across the group. Um, as you've seen before, programming will go for people who know how to software and code. 3D printing will work across who is necessary to create the components, which allows us to attach our Raspberry Pi sense uh, circuit and everything like that. And then as for networkings, we need the networking to be able to run through the household. So as for the sensors and everything, everything can communicate in a sense. Um, we are able to gain Raspberry Pi through the school, which helps us with our budgeting as well. And it's pretty, our project is pretty achievable, but also feasible. As we can see on the next slide with budget, um, Raspberry Pi, as I said, was obtainable through our school, which is going to be our main computer chip for the drone to know when to track motion and finding its charging bay when needed. Uh, 3D printer is ex as well free as it states because we have people that are allowing us to borrow one. Um, we need a 3D printer to be able to make a weatherproof case for the drone, I mean cover. Um, making brackets to add devices to our drone, such as probably a bigger battery, etc., wireless charging pad to be able to work with our charging base. 
and then as well for an encasing for a charging base to make it weatherproof. The specific printing material is going to cost us about 58 to $60. The specific <laughs> material is PETG, which is a plastic that withstands high temperatures from UV rays in the sun, but as well as waterproof to protect the charging base and drone. The drone will cost us about $33. It is going to be necessary to track the area of land the customers would like to have tracked for motion. The drone itself is a self put drone, which allows us to be able to customize it to our specific needs. Um, the charging station, oh, my bad. The charging station would be about $24. Um, it would make up, it would basically make up of our wireless charging pad that would support the giving out power to the charging receiver that we have attached to our drone. Um, and then we also need to buy a set of infrared sensors, which will cost us about $11. And these are necessary because it would be able to track body motion in that specific areas with specific heat temperatures in, in that case. But also where it would not track temperatures such as animals or something like that. So then it could like, it's not a nonstop trying to fly out if a bunny's walking across the land specifically. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, our drone will solve the problem of eliminating blind spots of your typical mounted security cameras in today's uh, security systems. Um, our solution is relatively cheap, costing just over $130 to develop. Um, we have a great team dynamic here. Everyone has their roles and skills required, and we'll all be learning new skills together as we progress through this project. And we do have much to learn, but we are determined to get this thing up and running. Thank you very much. Hey, guys. Okay. That was solid. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> I, I round of applause for ourselves. <laughs> yeah, that was that was very well done, guys. Um, so the only uh... I take it back, your guys, this is pretty good. <laughs> Professor, you could uh, take back over your screen if you like. Yeah, uh, that's okay. Um, uh, where am I going? Did we lose the professor? Yeah. No, I'm here. I Dang, was that no, mind blowing? I'm here. Yeah, we're bored, we're bored to death. Oh, there it is. No, no, it's okay. I, I, um, let me just, uh, share my screen. Just jotting down the bullet points. Yeah, so that, that was good. I was, I was pretty happy with that. I, I would have liked to have seen, you actually mentioned it right at the end. I would have liked to have seen the, the, the total budget. I would have liked to have seen a bit more about the schedule. Um, but everything else, um, you you hit the 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 points pretty pretty well does anybody oh, I, forgot to, I forgot to add total cost my bad <laughs> does um does anybody from the audience have any questions for them no so um i what sort of a drone can you get for 33 dollars that sounds like a pretty good deal we found a um a DIY self-build drone on Amazon, and it basically comes with the essentials that we need, except the battery would be just basically not enough to power the drone, as well as the Raspberry Pi device. So then that is our plan to also f find the specific drone. I mean, find the specific battery that would be able to withstand the drone power and Raspberry Pi. It's just our Raspberry Pi takes in 5 volts and the drone takes in about 3.7 volts. So that's also the just the situation we're just trying to figure out first as well. Okay. So um, one of the things you need to do next is to do a bit of uh, thinking about the power. And I would also wonder about the lift of the of the drone right if the the if you're going to change the battery it's going to change the weight change the weight yeah right. and that's why we found motors as well we're just at we're just we haven't gotten the components in yet to understand how everything would work together also we're just doing more research for now basically right. but we have everything planned out for if something goes wrong we have also other 
characteristics to add to our drone because we found greater motors as well that so, would be able to lift it right so that and again the um the suggestion though is to do try and do those uh calculations on the back of an envelope before buying anything right yeah and yeah. um that, that's that, that's what we've been doing the math for the past week also yeah and that that that's that's basically what we need to do in the next uh in the next section of the the course is is some of those power budget weight budget um uh not just dollar budget but no they're very well done okay um so let me uh just put that up so we've we've had the home security team next up is the fridge automation team and uh i'll stop sharing again and uh you can uh Share your screen. So can everyone see this? Me. Yeah, it keeps uh, going all white. I can see it. Oop. There we go. Yeah, it keeps coming in. <laughs> you could also just share the screen too. Yeah, it's it keeps going all white and okay. stays all white for quite a while, and then. Uh... You could try starting to present and then sh and then go to Discord after, and then you could select a specific window program screen. Because sharing your whole screen might also get junky. Yeah. yeah. That's more stable. Yeah. All right, sounds good. So we are the Smart Fridge Upgrade team. We changed it from the Fridge Automation. Okay, I'll make sure I change the the names in the uh, the the slides going forward, and uh, probably in Discord as well. So that's good. All right. So I'm Michael Poloka. My partners are Eric Burston and Anthony Mezumechi. Um, so our first slide. Uh, the problem we're facing right now. So every day, the market for smart home appliances continues to grow and they're being incorporated in homes more and more as they become cheaper and uh, readily available. Um, we decided to focus on the fridge because it's one of the appliances that you interact with most on a daily basis in your home. And we found that currently the market price for smart fridges is a little bit on the high end. Um, according to an article from ReviewGeek, they can cost anywhere from $2,000 to $6,000, but I've seen prices even higher than that. Um, and a regular refrigerator starts at about $800. So if you're someone who is very much into tech industry and you're into smart home um, appliances, it's not as available as you would like it. So we're hoping to create a product that for a price of 150 or less, be able to turn their fridge into a smart fridge. So our solution will provide an affordable device to the consumer based off Raspberry Pi, and it will allow them to run their current refrigerators that have non-smart fridge capabilities into a smart fridge. Um, it has to be easy to install, because not everyone is a techie, and it has to provide a similar experience to what current smart fridges on the market offer. We haven't really found any competitors. There was one uh, do-it-yourself from about five years ago, and all he offered was taking pictures with um with the camera he had installed in the fridge, and it would FTP it to a website. That was the full extent of its capabilities. We're hoping to create something that's a little bit more broad. Um, so some of the objectives for it. The device will provide a food inventory system for the consumer, and these can be scanned in using, at the moment we're thinking of using a barcode scanner, but if we can get it so our phones or plan on implementing a tablet if we can as an interface, um, to use that to scan them in, that'd be more convenient, but if not, we're going to stick with the barcode scanner. 
Um, let's see. When you're on the go, or when you're at home, plan on the fridge. Every time you open the door, it will take a snapshot of what you have inside. And it will upload it to one of our domains. And it will store three to four of the most recent images before it recycles them and empties them out. Just so it keeps you with the most up-to-date images. When you're on the go, you can connect um, through a mobile app that we're planning on making. See what you have in your fridge, or you can access your inventory list that you made. Um, it has to be on a secure network. You don't want anyone bypassing it and getting into your home network and stealing information from you. Um, the device will provide updates to the consumer on food recalls. And again, the touch interface, we're hoping to use an old tablet and attach it to the outside of the door and hopefully we can have the app running on it that we're planning on making so the user can have a more user-friendly experience when interacting with the fridge. Um, I think Anthony is next. So for an order, in order for us to be successful, uh, we're going to be needing communication and strategic planning uh, to meet our goals, especially with the state of everything in COVID. Um, it's going to be pretty impractical to meet over every single detail. So our communication will have to be specific and detailed to basically convey the things uh, that are lost over the internet. Uh, uh, we're going to need to familiarize ourselves with 3D printing. Uh, to create a simple and easy uh, mount that will go inside of our uh, fridge and house all the components. Uh, we want it to be something super simple that just about anybody can use. Uh, like Michael said, uh, this isn't for someone who's technically inclined. We want just about everyone to be able to do it. Um, we're going to need to become productive in Python code uh, simply because uh, our Raspberry Pi a Raspberry Pi utilizes that, and it's also a really good uh, language to be learning, especially now. Um, we're going to need to design a website uh, that will provide most of the functionality for our project. It's going to be important to also create something that's simple and comprehensive, while also complex to receive these photos and the barcode data to make suggestions on that. Um, next slide. So, um, from the very beginning, I understand it doesn't make sense that we have two people in the leadership position, uh, but my role is sort of a lesser lesser leadership position and more of a financial responsibility uh, as they're grouped together. Um, so Michael will be the main project leader while also focusing on financial as well as I will be focusing on financial. Um, everyone will be contributing in the coding uh, because that's going to be a learning experience for all of us. Um, me and Eric will be focusing on the hardware, uh, but everyone's going to have our input in that. Uh, networking uh, will be focused on Eric and Michael, and Eric will be our submissions guy. Thank you, Eric. And next slide. <clears throat> so... Given our $150 budget, uh, so far that we can see that we're, we're utilizing about $70 of that. And it's really important to us to stay at a low entry cost uh, because that is the entire problem at hand. Um, so that, that's just something we're trying to keep in mind throughout the entire project. Uh, so we're going to be using our Raspberry Pi, our Model 3B, um, a soldering kit that we already have lying around. So we don't have to tack that on to the price. Um, camera modules, we're going to be using two of them. And that's going to run us about $50. Uh, we also have Samsung tablets uh, lying around already. So we're going to be using that most likely for our grocery list. That's going to be on, on fridge. And um, obviously we're going to have our domain name that's going to house most of the information. Um, that's going to be two ninety nine a year uh, from GoDaddy. Um, we already have a fridge, so we're prepared for that. And we're also going to be adding a barcode scanner, uh, which is our fifteen dollar cost. All right, and uh, I'm going to be handing it off to Eric. 
So this is our schedule. This is a uh, subject to change, considering that it's tough to plan out into the fall <laughs> semester. But through the end of March, we finished up our use case diagram for the smart fridge upgrade and began our project proposal draft. Uh, throughout mid-April, we've finished our project proposal presentation, which we are currently presenting now. Uh, after this, we will begin our project design and preliminary design. And by the end of the semester, we're hoping to have our preliminary design finished and be able to present it to the class. Uh, over summer break, we don't really plan on doing anything as instructed by the professor. Apparently, that doesn't work out too well. Um, so next slide. So throughout September, we plan on starting our detailed design and work on that through the beginning of October. And after that, we begin working on our prototype in mid-October and work on that until mid-November, troubleshoot it until December, and present our final prototype during finals week of next semester. Next slide. So our final thoughts, uh, the smart fridge upgrade will be able to provide consumers with a much cheaper way of adding smart technology to their existing refrigerator, uh, coming in at a building cost of around $70, and considering competitors cost around two to $6,000, we have a lot of breathing room for profit. Uh, each team member's skills are acknowledged in their respective roles. As a group, we got together and decided who's more experienced in each role, and we assigned them to each other respectively. Uh, the schedule is subjected to change, as mentioned before, because it's kind of hard to plan over after the summer and the next semester. Uh, the purpose, use, and aim of the project has been determined, and our next step is to begin a physical design and how to connect all the hardware together and how to implement it on a fridge without disturbing the actual function of the fridge. Thank you very much. This is our references. Okay, thank you. Um, that was that was good too. Um, I liked all the references. That was that was very well done. Um, probably should have picked up the the uh, home security guys on the references, but uh, I I liked the um, I even liked the self references. To your uh, your uh, um, previous work in this course. So that's good. A um, couple of things. It's possible to do um, barcode scanning just using a phone. So you may not need a separate barcode scanner. Um, okay. So have a, have a bit of a dig at that. Um, I know because uh, a capstone student um, team that I'm mentoring at uh, Fairfield is looking at um, doing better security on boarding passes for planes and they found out that the the barcodes on boarding passes are completely unencrypted and they've they've written a little app that will allow you to uh, decode the barcode on a um, on a boarding pass they've also written other code to encrypt and generate a, an encrypted barcode and then the app does the scanning of the barcode and then and also decrypts the barcode so it's that's kind of cool um but yeah uh think about that um think about buying another raspberry pi um like i think i've said before um having just one is is fraught with peril because something happens at the end um Either you spill coffee on it or uh, something, uh, and I, I'd suggest that for, for to all groups just to make sure that you you have um, a backup plan. Um, yeah, I think uh, that I I had a look at the uh, I think you put a link in the the group chat for for this team. Um, 
for the for the guy you referenced who did a a similar project a few years ago and uh that was that was interesting i was um i was surprised that uh uh how much that guy got done on relatively little effort so that i think uh you can you can do a lot more and i think uh aim to get what he got done but then i think having a bit more of a an inventory system would be nice and some of the other bells and whistles that you've talked about would be good okay um so let's i haven't been sharing my screen let's go share my screen again can i also just comment on what you said just yeah go for it go for it uh, so in his example he he actually mounts it by uh screwing it into the existing fridge uh we definitely want to take a different approach to where it can almost universally be mounted in without any additional screwing or actual ruining of the fridge. Right, right. No, that's um, and then uh, having to, I don't know, having to uh, route the the wiring through the the out, uh, you know, through the um, the seal on the fridge might be. Might yeah. be a little hard for somebody to do too, but anyway, there's there's lots there to to think about. So that's good. Anybody else from the the class have any comments or questions? Yeah, we'll just have it. <laughs> if not, um, I want to buy one. <laughs> that I would help me a lot. I would definitely want one. So if you're, a, if you're our first customer, we'll give you a free T-shirt. Hey, <laughs> sign me up. <laughs> Very good. Okay, so let's uh, move on, and we'll go with the. I uh, don't know what the project is called now, but the uh, the parking automation team. I just kept that name. Okay, that's all right. So yeah. I'm going to uh, stop sharing my screen, and if you can share yours. There we go. All right. Can you guys see that all right? Does it work? Cool. All righty. So um, our project is the parking automation project. Um, essentially what this project entails is creating a small device that can be used um, in association with a web application or um, a mobile application rather that um, can tell you before you even enter a parking lot or garage what uh, parking spaces are available or filled. That way you don't have to go hunting around for parking space for 10 minutes. Um, I'm sure all of you guys have tried to find parking in Central or other metropolitan areas where you can't. It takes 10 minutes easily to find a parking space if it's a busy day. Um, and a lot of hassle of stop and go. Um, which is not good on your car. It's not good on your gas mileage. Um, it's a waste of time. And this product prevents all of that. Um, by simply telling you where, where there's an available parking spot. Um, so people spend around 17 hours every year trying to find a parking space, which doesn't sound like a lot, but when you add it up, it's it gets to be dramatic, and it, it becomes a large amount of money lost. Um, around $345 um, per year for just doing essentially nothing. Um, so by using the parking automation, we can avoid um, sitting around and uh, it's significantly, you know, it's inexpensive. They're small, they're not intruding on, um, you know, walk spaces or anything like that. And uh, it's just a simple app that you can use to find your parking space so it's, it's not hard to use. Um, so you could prop up your, your phone and check uh, where it is 
or it'll tell you. Um, yeah, so um, it, it just determines what parking spaces are available. All right, Fahim? Uh, good morning, Professor. Good morning, everyone. So the factional and, and non-factional requirement, um, well, this system is going to be wired and Wi-Fi network too. So wired system is make it um, response faster and give the driver's life real-time data for stat for each parking and um, telling them telling the drivers where is the empty space. And the system is have the ability to detect if any accident in a parking lot and let the driver and the many the parking manager there is accident in the parking lot. And um, if something had been due to the weather or uh, system problems, the the system, the functional, oh, will let the drivers the parking lot, parking lot is out of surface. And um, for the cross functional, this system, it doesn't have no um, capacity limit. It could go as much as the parking lot space have a well functional or functional on it and um, this system is um, will work with magnetic field so when is a car coming to the parking space is able to make a difference between pedestrian and car and send it the signal to the to the front uh, screen system And um, the system it should have long life battery. So if something happened to power, it will pick up and work in itself and with minimum energy con consumption of the hardware. So it will last longer. And that's for the functional requirement. Next slide, please. <laughs> There we go. And this is our use case diagram. Um, of course, we have our driver entering the parking lot, um, and they're, they're, they need to see immediately what spots are available and what spots are occupied um, so that they interface directly with the parking application. Um, and when they actually do take a space, it needs to be able to record um, what space they're in so that the person behind them who's who's also using the same application can tell you know immediately that that space is taken um, delay is kind of a a bad thing for these kind of systems so um, that's something that we will avoid that way we can immediately you know once they take it we already know we can't go there we'll find the next one down the line um, so these processes are being um, sought out by the parking application, uh, which is our, our actual mobile app, and then the parking lot manager, which is the actual devices. All right, so um, the stuff that are required, uh, we need CAD design and implementation. So like 3D printing, designing, uh, stuff like that. Uh, that way we can utilize and protect our uh, anything inside of it, our microcontrollers, um, specifically our, our Arduino that we're going to be using is going to be inside of there and we can't have it getting damaged from um, weather or anything like that. Um, it needs to be securely in place. It can't be moved around. Um, on its own will or you know by small adjustments it needs to have some way of, of essentially being bolted down to the ground um, basically it needs to be kind of kind of idiot proof and it needs to be uh, durable um, programming in C 
uh, is another thing, or programming in general, rather, uh, for our Arduino and whatever else uh, we need to implement. Um, we need soldering because we're going to have to uh, solder on our wires and uh, for our servos and our sensors. And of course, we need someone who can drive. Um, I know it's kind of tacked on to the end, but it's still important. Of course, we got to test this thing out and we got to make sure it works properly. And this is going to require a lot of testing, especially because there's uh, potentially multiple devices that will be used. Um, all right. Michael? All right. The rules of our group are as follows. We have project leader, it's Kyle, coding, it's Kyle Fahim. 3D printing slash, you know, CAD and, you know, actually making the design, I guess, would say I, I took that role. And then for the submissions, we have Fahim and Kyle. And I know the roles are a little bit flexible because we kind of all just work together and try to get it done as a collective. But just for, just to have the roles in place, you know, kind of separates it in a sense. Just to add on to that, there's only three of us, so... Um... Even though these are our priority roles for each person, we'll definitely be um, kind of intermingling with these as we go on. Yep. All right. Our feasibility. Okay. Um, this there are a lot of uh, sorry, what's it called? <clears throat> Projects and technologies in the world right now that actually implement this same kind of idea. Um, so. I believe, and we believe that with this, this project should be a success, because it's not like we're starting something from scratch. You know, there's already, like, examples of this in the world now. Um, <clears throat> each of our team members will be assigned tasks to complete by a given time inside the project, and by assigning specific tasks, the project can be accomplished by an approximation of the closing date. And financially, the project budget dictates that the project is feasible, as shown in the budget section. Um, budget, you know, we have um, some is free, given by the professor, and some we have to buy them, like you see, like you guys see in the screen. The um, Arduino, we get a free from the professor, as well as the Raspberry Pi. And our project will need servo motor, which is going to cost $8.99. And the IR sensors, that's two of them, one for in, one for out. And the LCD display and the total cost and total blast tax was going to come up to $41.76. You see, uh, there is no 3D printer. I didn't miss it, but I'm waiting for a friend of mine. Maybe he gonna let me use his, and he didn't know yet other equipment is with it, or maybe I need to buy other equipment with a 3D printer. I don't include it yet till I see. Um, if we got it free, I will add it and see free. If not, I will add it the price to it. So the total of our budget has come to 4176 try to shop around and see what's you know the least expensive because these days we're trying to save as much we can and that's all for the budget yep so our schedule um obviously march we you know selected the project team project proposal um currently we're doing uh we're finalizing proposal and currently doing the team proposal presentation um, May, we're going to be doing the preliminary design and, you know, submitting the preliminary um, design doc and doing the preliminary design presentation. Um, and then we're off for three months for summer break. And then starting up in the fall, we got the detailed design and we got the document and the presentation as well with that. And then getting into October, we have the pre-prototype and we're going to have the mid, um, we're going to be creating the materials, or sorry, <clears throat> confirming confirming dimensions and creating the actual product, or the first draft, as you'd say. 
And into November, we got testing and troubleshooting, and that's going to be, you know, doing trial and error and making sure our product works and everything is working correctly how we want it. And in December, we will be finishing up the prototype and doing the final documentation and presentation and demonstration, I guess. So, with a series of small devices and application and a mobile device, um, parking spots can be found before even entering the actual parking lot or garage. The time saved by knowing where the closest parking space is is significant, and uh, because of its inexpensive cost, we have it at around $41, um, just shy of $42 for our prototype. Um, that makes it completely affordable for... Um, to for smaller parking lots in areas that you know obviously don't want to spend a lot of money, um, we have uh, like our budget stated. We have servo motors costing nine dollars, IR sensors costing twenty two dollars total, um, with the total coming out at at that forty two dollar mark. Um, the completion timetable for this project uh, sets it at around December of twenty twenty one. Um, the design will be ready for September, and uh, everything will be completed by December. Uh, the prototype will be completed by December. Um, for the schedule, I just wanted to write this as a quick note. I didn't want to make it too detailed because, um, as I know from personal experience, I didn't want to uh, to make it something that could change you know, I want to make it a little bit broader so that we could work out our own schedules, you know, at the time being based on both our school and work schedules um, to figure out the best times for those. All right. Thank you for listening, guys. That is that is our project, our automation project. Ooh. Ooh. Okay. Uh, let me... Uh... Go live again. Okay, thank you. Does anybody have any questions for the parking automation team? So I have a, a couple of things. Um, just, uh, you, you have a display in there. What what size of display is that going to be? It's going to be very small. Um, we're thinking like maybe a few inches big. Um, so that way we can fit it into the small um, device box. Okay. And you're using the IR sensors to detect the vehicle, is that right? Correct. Okay. Yeah, you might want to do a little bit of um, experimenting with that just because their placement and um, dealing with sun and other lighting and uh, just generally um, you, you may need more than two um, but yeah it's 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 doable it just needs um, I, I suspect that will need a bit of uh, experimentation to get it right yeah I'm sure one of our most arduous sections is going to be the uh, testing making sure everything actually works um, yeah, we can we're going to choose two sensors is one for entering the parking lot and one exit. So every car enter will, you know, the Arduino will send it a message to the display. We're going to have LCD display telling us how many space left. So our project is going to have some certain parking space. We're going to like do three, four, five parking space. Okay. Sounds so good. One R IR sensor is going to be for entering. Another one is going to be for exiting the park. So if there is car entering, it will display one car, one space is full occupied. We should uh, see about uh, instrumenting one of the on-campus car parks, although I, I don't know how, how successful that would be. Um, so uh, the other question I had, I, I've, got a lot of, I've got a lot more questions about this one. I don't know why that is. Um, mm -hmm. How long did you expect the batteries to last for the system? So, um, I haven't quite gotten that far, but my plan was to do something that's self-sustainable, because um, obviously it's gonna—it's it, kind of one of those things that you want to be able to forget about. 
um, in terms of maintenance and upkeep. So, um, like a solar power solution is uh, is feasible for that. Of course, it depends on you know if it's an outdoor garage or an indoor garage. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And like the, a rechargeable camera battery or something. Yep. Cool. Yep. The only other piece of feedback I had is um, on the budget. Uh, I would ha add a contingency line, even if uh, for your report about the uh, 3D printer material, if not the 3D printer itself. So, um, you know, the, the previous one of the previous teams had a sixty dollar. Uh, material cost for the um, uh, for the 3D printer, so something like that, thirty dollars, fifty dollars, sixty dollars, something like that, just as a contingency line item. Um, now you you don't have to detail what you need now, but put in a a non-zero figure um, as a placeholder for for what you're going to need to spend on 3D printed material. Okay. Um, actually, the other thing I had about 3D printers is I believe the library has some. And by the time we get to the fall semester, they may be available again. Okay. Oh, cool. So, I didn't even know they had this. Yeah, I didn't either. And I only found out after we went into lockdown and they haven't been available <laughs> since then. So, um Hi. <laughs> Uh, I've, I've been itching to, to get somebody to try them out. But um, the other thing is we do have another 3D, pr a pretty big 3D printer in the, uh, the graphics lab. Um, and uh, I know there's some students who are looking at using it once we get back on campus, but we'll, we'll have to see what, what its availability is. Okay. Um, I don't have much else to talk about today. Um, thank you, everyone. I've, I'm very happy with all of those. Um, just a quick comparison between the different um, presentations. Um, I thought our uh, parking automation, I liked the idea of minimizing what you put on, the, um, on each slide. I thought that was very good making the talk the prime thing i would i think you just went a little too far i think having a little bit more text um particularly for the um uh for the requirements piece might be might have been better um having said that i thought the home security team for their functional requirements did a good job you don't want to bore your audience with shall statements um, in a presentation. You can certainly say them, but I liked the way the home security team just had a one or two word per uh, functional requirement um, on their, in their presentation. I thought that was about the right level. Enough to hang the talk on, but um, not enough, not a not a wall of words, which is um, something I I, I keep uh, coming across in a lot of presentations. Um, yeah, I think that's all I have. So what I need from you between now and next week is to uh, finalise your proposal documents. Um, I'd like them done by this day next week um, but if you want to submit them earlier I can I can give you feedback on them um, before that uh, due date um, just in case there's there's something it's, it's worthwhile getting early feedback even if it's a, a rough draft um, and then we'll next week we'll kick off how to start a design which um, We've got, I think we've got three good projects here, so uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what we have to do. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Any questions? No? Well, that's... Uh... Yeah, so yep. I have a question. Yeah, go for it. So 
is the project proposal in the presentation due next week? The like, uh, the so versions the, of so there should be two things. One of them is the presentation. I'd like you to upload the slides you used now or soon. Um, the actual document proposal document um, is due next week, and that's that's why I scrolled to this screen. Do you want the um, shared link submission on the same project proposal assignments assessment section? Sorry, say that again. Because there's no there's no um proposal. I mean presentation to submit on assessment section. Oh, isn't that's it? What I was, oh, well, then no, in that that's case... what I was curious about before also. Ah, okay. I didn't realize that. Let me. Uh... I obviously did something wrong. There's the project proposal. But there is no presentation. I need to make a presentation. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just, uh, let me do that while we're here. So, uh, project proposal presentation. Um, so upload, upload your slides here. And so is it fine if I um, just send the, the, just add the shared link to our shared slide doc? Yeah. Um, in the comment section of that assessment? If that works. Or do, you um, want me to, or do you want me to save the... I could save it as well. Why, why don't you say, save it as a PowerPoint? That way it's, All right. it's, it's sounds great. disconnected. Um, I think it's easy enough to do in Google Docs. Yeah, sounds great. Let me just see if... I don't know whether I've got a preliminary design presentation. Proposal presentation. I did have that. Okay, sorry about that. I should have... I thought I'd done that before. And just if you can get that done today, that would be good. Okay, so now that's down the bottom of the assessment piece. Okay, thank you everyone. Have a great weekend and I will talk to you next week. You as well, Professor. Have a good one. Yeah. Yeah, we can. yeah. Have a good one. Yep. Bye bye. Uh, Michael and Eric, I'm gonna Stopping the channel.